Well, it is Father's Day weekend, as you know by now, and a father has many different roles in a household. And, um, you know, some of those roles uh, have to do with, Daddy, she won't give me back my doll. You know, we've got to take care of that. Or, Dad, he's got my fishing pole. Or my favorite, Dad, he's looking out my window when we're in the back of the car. Right, Aaron? She remembers that. You know, dads play many, many different roles. There's no question about that. But fathers are always called, are often called, to calm the storms that happen in their homes. Whether it's he's looking out my window or she's got my doll or, or something more of a greater magnitude, fathers are called to calm the storm. But many times fathers aren't even understood in their own, in their own. Sometimes mom doesn't even understand that. And so, now those of you that have been married for a while, well, perhaps, perhaps you do understand a little better uh, your husband or children, your father. But for those newlyweds, like maybe Sean and Maya, uh, understanding men uh, and what they say and what they mean. So here's a little lesson for those of you. Uh, if you haven't figured this out yet, or if you're newlywed, uh, this, is, this is some of the differences between men and, uh, and uh, women. When a man says, it would take too long to explain, he simply means that he has no idea how it works. Right? That's just the way it is. When a man says that... Uh, says to his wife, take a break, honey, you're working too hard. That typically means, hey, I can't hear the TV over the vacuum cleaner, right? When a man says, oh, honey, it's a guy thing. Okay, th this, is, this is my favorite here. It's a guy thing, right? You know what that means? That means that, that we have absolutely no uh, uh, logical uh, explanation for for what's happening and what's going on. And so we, oh, it's a guy thing. When a man says, can I help with dinner? What he's really saying, ladies, is, why isn't dinner ready yet? When a man says, uh-huh, sure, honey, or yes, dear, that, that has no meaning whatsoever. That's like a conditioned response that's built into us. We just say these things. When a man says, you know how my memory is. Well, what he really means is, you know, I can remember, um, I can remember every car that I've had. I can remember the the first girl that I kissed. Um, he's saying I can remember, like I can remember the vehicle identification number of every car that I ever owned. But yeah, I forgot your birthday. Men are different. We're not the same. When a man says, hey, I just cut myself, but it's no big deal, what he means is I've probably severed a limb, but, and I'm about to bleed to death, but I'm not going to admit that, uh, uh, that to you that I'm hurt. Right? Yeah, Clyde, you can relate to that, can't you? We all can. When a man says, ah, I can't find it. This is my favorite. This is what I do with Carol. It simply means that, hey, I, I, it didn't fall into my outstretched arms. W where is it? Right? And by the way, more often than not, it's right in front of us. But we're men. We're not expecting it to be right in front of us, so we don't see it. When a man says, honey, you look absolutely terrific, what he's saying is, oh, please don't try on one more outfit. Let's go out. I'm starving. I need to eat. This is one of my favorites. When a man says, I'm not lost, I know exactly where we are. Yeah. Yeah, he, he means that no one's ever going to see us again. We're doomed. Fathers are not mothers. Thank goodness. Fathers can be a very strange breed indeed. 
And it's important for a family to know that because oftentimes fathers are called to calm the storm. And if you don't understand who you're dealing with, you're not going to understand the methods of calming that storm. So Father's Day. Fathers are a strange, strange breed. A mother was out walking with her little four-year-old daughter one day, and uh, the child, and, and mothers, you can relate to this, child bent down and picked up something off the, off the street, and where, where was it going? To the mouth, right? And why kids do that? Why do you kids do that? Josiah, why do you do that? So <laughs> It's fun. Well, as a mother... A mother's programmed response is, is, honey, don't put that in your mouth. And she, she took it away from her little daughter. And her daughter said, why not? Why can't I put it in my mouth? And her mother said, because it was on the ground, honey. You don't know where it's been. It's dirty. Uh, there could, there's lots of germs on it. It could make you sick. And so the little child looked at her mother with just total uh, awe and amazement. And she said, wow, mom. How do you know all this stuff? You are so smart. And mom said, well, you know, you, you, you learn, moms know this stuff. We, we're taught this uh, when we take the mom's test. We have to know all these things. That's why we know. And so there was silence for a little bit. And then the little girl looked up at her mom and she said, oh, I get it now, mom. She said, and if you don't pass the mom's test, then you have to be a daddy, right? Welcome to Father's Day, 2021. Who would have believed that in the year 2021, we would still be sitting here waiting for Jesus to come? I, for one, never imagined that would happen. As a matter of fact, when my son Matthew was born, and then my daughter Erin, I didn't think they would grow to adulthood. I didn't even think they would become teenagers, because I thought Jesus would be here before that. And when they hit their teenage years, I thought, well, I don't think they're going to see adulthood. And here they are, both adults. And Jesus has still not come. You know, perhaps we should not dwell so much on the fact that Jesus has not come yet. Because God knows. He, he, is, he has his perfect timing. He knows the right time. Perhaps you and I, and fathers in particular, perhaps we should focus on the fact that, you know what? Jesus hasn't come yet, so this is a good time for me to get involved in my children's lives. God is giving me more time to get involved with my family and with my children. These are, these are stressful times, brothers and sisters. And if you think your children aren't stressed out, think again. In some cases, your children, teenagers in particular, are way more stressed than their parents. This is a time that requires excellent parenting skills. You know, not every biological father is a good dad. And today, there are stepfathers who, have, who are facing the challenge of being a dad to children who uh, uh, may or may not accept them as their stepdad. We're living in, a, in an age today where grandfathers have been called to fill the role of a surrogate dad. It's not supposed to be that way, but yet here we are. The why, why are grandparents being called, called to raise children today? Because we have become so consumed in a world that is full of materialism and pleasure and drugs, and we're caught up. Children are no longer our top priority, it would seem. But you know, brothers and sisters, Jesus has not come back yet. A good time for you and I to step in and be the parent to our children, whether they are young, teenagers, or adult, that they need us to be. Don't waste the time moaning and moping that Jesus hasn't come. Why isn't he here? Use it to be a productive parent. Use it to guide your children to the promised land. I want you to open your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4. There is a record there 
in that particular chapter of a storm that was calm. Matthew chapter, uh, Mark, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 4, verse 37. Mark chapter 4, verse 37. And look at what it says. It says, There arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, that is Jesus, asleep on a pillow. And there the disciples awakened him and said unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And Jesus rose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one, on, one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? What manner of man is this? You know, our scripture today it speaks of a time when Christ was uh, in the boat with the disciples. A great storm arose. The disciples thought they were going to perish. Jesus was asleep on the pillow. You ever been on a ship or on a boat when the waves were a little rough? And the stomach mm, mm. That's a horrible feeling. And I would imagine from the description we're given in Mark that this storm was probably a lot worse than any storm you or I have ever been in. And while the disciples, mind you, they, many of them were seasoned fishermen, they were fearful that they were going to die. Jesus was asleep on a pillow. Ah, oh, the peace that passes all understanding in, in full view right there in this text. Jesus asleep on the pillow. But the disciples wake, awakened him and said, look, we're going to die, don't you care? And Jesus spoke to the wind and calmed the storm. And, um, and um, the frightened disciples uh, you know, didn't know how to react. And, and so what happened next is actually uh, uh, pretty amazing. After Jesus says, uh, see, be still, peace be still, right? What happens next is the disciples turn to each other and they say, what, what manner of man is this that, that he can still the, the, the seas? And this after Jesus has said to them, O ye of little faith, right? But they marveled. Mark, Mark points this out. The disciples were more frightened now by the fact that Jesus could calm the storm than they were of the storm itself. And you know what? They should be frightened. Jesus was not an ordinary man. Only the power of God can calm an angry storm. And Jesus had done just that, proving that he was in complete and perfect connection with his Father in heaven. You know, Jesus is still in the business today of calming storms. And we need to understand that because sometimes a storm brews in our house and uh, we, we don't handle it well. We do not handle it well at all. Sometimes those storms are in our own individual hearts and we don't handle it very well. Sometimes those storms are, are in families with our children, our, our spouse. But Jesus Christ is still in the business of calming storms. You and I, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we should know that. I forget sometimes. I'll admit, I forget. And I would imagine some of you do too. You know, wherever there are people, there, if there isn't already, there is going to be a storm. People just kind of attract storms. And you know, those storms... They might be personal storms. They could be storms that are raging within the individual that you know nothing about. But all of a sudden you take the backlash or you take the brunt of their frustration and their storm. How do you react? 
our first in, in, in inclination is to act in such a way that we defend ourselves. Well, I'm not going to let them talk to me like that. We never give a consideration as to what might have caused them to say what they said to us or what might have caused them to act the way they acted towards us. For some reason, it becomes all about me. Well, I'm not going to let them talk to me like that. But Jesus, thankfully, was about other people. When Jesus calmed the storm, it was to save and to teach. Brothers and sisters, you and I, you and I are placed in situations every day, perhaps, where we're faced with a storm. How do you handle that storm? And fathers especially, how do you handle the storm of a rebellious child? How do you handle the storm of a spouse who has her own mind and won't listen? These are real life questions, but they are questions as a father we have to answer. If you remember on Mother's Day, I shared with you the results of an experiment that had been done with baby monkeys. They took that monkey away, the baby monkey away from their mother and they, gave a, uh, they provided a fake mother who gave the baby no love and no attention. And in every single instance, that baby monkey died. Well, holding in that monkey chimp experiment, uh, fathers, uh, I want to share an experiment with you. Um, it's a fascinating study. In fact, it was a, 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 I believe it was the same study group as the, the previous study I just mentioned. But it was a kind of a cruel study as well, and it was done by a group of scientists in Russia. And they subjected a group of chimpanzee, chimpanzees to an assortment of various experiments that made them violently and, and, and helplessly jealous. And one of the uh, experiments, they would take a chimpanzee who had been living with uh, his family, and suddenly they just ripped him away from the family and they put him in a cage that was next to the family. He could see the family, but he couldn't touch the family. He could see, but he couldn't interact with the family. And uh, the chimpanzee became more and more irritated as time went on. And he began screaming with rage. Uh, and the, more, the fact that he could only watch... Uh, uh, his fury just mounted and grew. Within three months, that chimpanzee was dead. The cause of death, hardening of the arteries and high blood pressure. His death, he was killed by his own jealousy and his own rage. You see, a storm within one's own soul can be an epic storm. A storm within one's own heart can be the toughest storm that you will ever face. Jealousy, anger, bitterness, guilt, these are all storms. The list of storms that can rock your world, can rock our individual souls, is a lengthy list indeed. And you and I, when we're faced with these storms, fathers, when you're faced with these fami uh, family storms, Remember that Jesus Christ is still in the business of calming storms. He is there for you. There are many storms. Some storms rock our relationships. Um, in the 19th century, there was a philosopher named Arthur Schopenhauer, and he compared the human race to porcupines huddled together on a bitter cold winter night. The colder it got outside, the more the porcupines huddled together for warmth. But the closer we as humans got to one another, he found the more hurt that we provided to one another with our sharp quills. Fathers, Christ calms the storm within us. Now, I want you to listen to me carefully. Fathers, how can you possibly calm a storm 
in your own home if the storm in your own heart is still raging? You can't. Today, I would encourage fathers to look inward. Look to Jesus. Let him quell, quench, quench the, the storm that may be raging within you. You know, when I was a kid, I used to watch Bruce Lee movies. Uh, you, you, so you're laughing, so I, uh, thankfully you, you know who he is. But there was one movie uh, that there was, a quote, there was a quote from this movie that I read years later, and it always stuck with me. And I looked it up, and I want to share it with you. It says, it says, his mentor was talking to him, and he said to him, we all have inner demons to fight. We call these demons fear and hatred and anger. If you do not conquer them, then a life of 100 years is a tragedy. If you do conquer them, the life of a single day is a triumph. Now, it does not make sense. You know, the, the mentor in this, in this book, in this quote, went on to say that you have to conquer the demons inside you, otherwise you will pass them on to your children. How many of you want to do that? None. One reason that we have conflict with others, friends, is that we have conflict within ourselves. Now, we're often part of the problem rather than part of the solution. We had a church member in our first church uh, who, who made that statement. That was his, one of his favorite statements. He said, um, let's not be part of the problem. Let's be part of the solution. And I thought, doesn't that make sense? And it applies to every aspect in life, every walk of life. Let's not be part of the problem. Let's be part of the solution. But you know, we're often uh, part of the problem and not the solution. We strike back when we should keep quiet. You know, Joe Cruz, you remember Joe Cruz, founder of Amazing Facts uh, uh, um, Ministry? He wrote a little book one time um, called The Tiny Troublemaker. Who, who, who do you think he was referring to? The littlest guy in the family? Was it the two-year-old? or the, Who was he talking about? The tongue. The tiny troublemaker that resides right in this area. And boy, you know, brothers and sisters, if we could learn to control our tongue, if we could only learn to bite that tongue instead of saying something at an inappropriate time. And by the way, an inappropriate time to say something is when someone levels an outlash of anger and hatred your way. That's not the time to speak. That's the time to but bite the tongue. You can't talk when you're biting. Literally, you cannot talk when you're biting your tongue. Bite your tongue. But we don't. We strike back. And out comes a, a, a slew of, of words that we should never have said. And we can never take back. You know, we, we disparage when it's time to encourage. We, we sulk when it's time to reach out and help. We have to calm the storm within, brothers and sisters, before we can have a satisfactory relationship with anyone else. You know, there was a, a baseball player. I didn't grow up with this stuff, but I find this man's story very, very interesting. He was a man named Mickey Mantle. Anybody ever hear of him? Oh, yeah? Okay, good. <laughs> I wasn't sure if he was super famous or just famous, famous. But anyway, Mickey Mantle. So he uh, was interviewed uh, shortly before he died. And um, I guess he had been, you know, uh, well, you all know him, so he must have been a pretty decent ball player in his day. And uh, I guess he broke records and did all kinds of good stuff. And uh, when his play playing days ended, uh, Mickey Mantle checked into the Betty Ford Clinic to deal with the consequences of a lifetime of alcohol abuse. So part of his struggle involved the loss of his son, Billy. Billy had died from a heart attack uh, while he was suffering from Hodgkin's disease, which is a genetic disease uh, which had killed Mantle's father 
and his grandfather as well at a very early age. So in the interview, Mickey Mantle said, one of the things I learned at the Betty Ford Clinic was why I was depressed. I wasn't a good father. I always felt like I wasn't there for my kids, like my father was for me. Sometimes we have to look ourselves square in the face and admit to some harsh realities. Sometimes we just didn't do enough. We weren't there when we should have been. We weren't quiet when we should have been. So what do we do? Now's not the time to sulk. Now's not the time to go into depression as Mickey Mantle did and, 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 and with the use of alcohol. Now is the time to recognize, brothers and sisters, that as a father, maybe I have fallen short in the past. But today is a new day, a new era, a new dawn has, has come. Today, dads, you can step up today. You can look in the mirror today. You can admit your guilt. You can admit your depression. You can admit that perhaps you weren't the best father in the world. You can call on Jesus to take away that depression, that guilt, whatever it might be. And you can call on him to help quench the, thor the storm that, it was in, that is within your own life. And then you can go and spend time with your family. Sometimes we have to conquer our own personal demons before we're any good to anybody else. Christ calms the storm first, and then he turned to the disciples and calmed them down. You know, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 through 23, the text, there's a text that says, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Fathers, we can look to our heavenly father. We can look to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as our example. That's quite an example, isn't it? The only way fathers can follow Christ's example is to walk closely with him. Walk as closely as you possibly can. Walk in the steps of Jesus. And the only way, dads, that you can do that is to spend time with him. And encourage your family to spend time with him. We need the spirit of God to enter into us and to make us new people. We need the stony heart to be removed and a heart of flesh to be placed in its place. We need to, uh, we need to claim the, 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 the statement in, in Psalms that the, the promise, Lord, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. We need to call on Jesus. This is so important for a father to have a stormless home. You know, it's said that surgeons uh, who are invited to dinner parties are often uh, asked to carve the meat, carve the turkey. You know, it's almost like, a, 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 let's see your skills, right? Or worse yet, they're forced to stand by and, and watch while the host carves all the while commenting on the surgeon's occupation, right? Well, at one party, a surgeon was watching his host carve uh, the turkey while making a running commentary. And he would carve off a piece and he'd say, hey, doc, what do you think of my technique? Pretty good, huh? And the doctor said nothing. And he'd carve another piece and he'd say, hey, don't you think I'd make a pretty good surgeon? The doctor said nothing. And uh, finally, when he was, had the meat all carved up, uh, he said to the surgeon, he said, so are you going to hire me? And um, the surgeon looked at him and he said, Harry, anybody can carve the meat apart. Now let's see you put it back together. What's true of meat 
is also true in relationships. It's much easier to carve a relationship apart than it is to put it back together. Christ is the great surgeon, my friends. He can heal a severed relationship. But it's better if things don't get to that point in the first place. And things usually get that far along because we speak before we think. Things usually get that far along because we want to defend ourselves. We've been so hurt by something that our child or our spouse said, and we want to defend ourselves. We don't stop to think. Sometimes the best thing you can possibly do is say nothing, especially in dealing with your children. Sometimes, you know, when I was um, interning at, at Florida Hospital in chaplaincy ministry, I remember uh, this young boy, I think he was 12, and he was having brain surgery, and it was a very serious situation. And his mother, I was there as the chaplain before he went in for surgery, and his mother was very distraught, and she came to me and she said, why is God letting this happen to my 12-year-old son? Now, I, I didn't have an answer. I, I didn't have an answer. And so, you know, I stood there and I thought about it, and I didn't say anything for the longest time. And, and in fact, it was after surgery when the son had uh, come through surgery well, was in recovery, and had a good prognosis. And by the way, the child went home a week or so later. But it was during that recovery period, I happened to be in the room, and the mother, uh, the mother was there, and I said to her, I said, you know, you asked me a question before your son went into surgery. And um, you asked me, why is God letting this happen? And I said, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know why God is letting this happen, but I do know that God loves you, and he loves your son. And I know that God will be with you every step of the way. And do you know what that lady said? She said to me, she said, I am so thankful you didn't answer that question when I asked it. She said, I wasn't really asking. I was venting. I just needed you to be there and to listen to me. And I did. Not because I was skilled or I had any special understanding. It's because I didn't know what to say. But God in his infinite wisdom knew what that lady needed. Sometimes, fathers, sometimes the easiest thing that we can do, the best thing rather that we can do, is to stop and just be there and listen to what your children or what your wife is saying to you. But dad, do you know the biggest problem? The biggest problem for fathers in the world today is that we succumb to the most, one of the most powerful weapons in the devil's arsenal. You know what that is? Distraction. Fathers, you know, this is very interesting to me because mothers don't seem to get distracted in the same way that fathers get distracted. We get distracted by sports. We get distracted by work. We get distracted by church. We get distracted by our neighbor mowing his lawn. We get dis whatever, it, we get distracted. Mothers tend to focus more on, on the children. They're not, they don't get that distracted, but we fathers do. And I believe that it is the devil's, one of the devil's weapons to keep his father away from his children. We get distracted. And in other words, we're now focused on something else. You know, there was a dad in his living room one evening, and he was engrossed in, in, in the evening news. He was watching it, and the little girl... Uh, his two-year-old daughter was fiddling around the, the house, and suddenly she came in, she walked into him, and uh, she walked more like a, a waddled, but she came into him with a little tiny teacup, and she had a tea set, and it had some water, and she said, Daddy, tea? And, oh, that's so cute, and he took the tea, and he drank the water, and he gave it back to her. So he kept watching this this, this thing that just he had to see in the news. So the daughter came back a little bit later with another little cup. Daddy, tea, all that. And he, so this happened three, four, five times, and the dad thought it was so cute. But he was engrossed. He didn't want to. He didn't want to play. He wanted to see what was going on in TV, on the on the news. Well, then the mother came home, 
And she walked into the room, and the dad said, oh, you got to see this, honey. Just, just don't do anything. Just wait. And sure enough, in comes the little two-year-old with a little cup, Daddy, tea? And he's, oh, thank you, honey. And he took the tea, and he drank it. He drank it, and he handed it back. And he looked at, at, his, at the mother, at, at his wife, and he says, isn't that so cute? And the mother looked at him, and she said, what's in there? He said, water. And the mother said, did it ever occur to you that the only place that our two-year-old can get water from is the toilet? <laughs> you know... We get distracted on things that are unimportant. We get distracted about, with things that we can catch up on later. How many of you have grown children? Yeah. How many of you would admit, or how many of you would say, it took them forever to grow up? How many of you would say, man, just like that, they were gone, right? Fathers, we get distracted in such a way that we make the devil happy because we're not giving our attention to our family. We're caught up in the news or the ball game or, or whatever. By the way, American football, I, I don't even know if I want to get started here. I know some of you are football fans, and, and, and that, first of all, you know, the psalmist says that we should turn our eyes away from violence. Well, I'm sorry, but American football is a very violent sport. I don't believe that that's a, a, I don't believe that's a sport that, anyway. You know, um, if you're one of those fathers that just has to sit and watch seven hours of football, as I used to do when I came to this country on a Sunday afternoon, let me share this with you. Uh, a news, a sports, a sports um, um, show um, asked the question one night, uh, how many minutes of action are there in a football game, an American football game? And um, so I would watch every Sunday, doubleheader, seven hours. I said, oh, it's about three hours, but obviously the game's only 60 minutes. You know, everything else, it just takes three hours to play. I said, so out of that 60 minutes, I'd say, I don't know, probably 40 minutes of action. Action being from the time that the ball is snapped till the time the, the play is whistled dead. The answer to the question on that show is the average action in a three and a half hour American football game is 12 and a half minutes. Do you know when I heard that, I never watched a football game again in its entirety. I'd watch highlights. I said, you know what? I can watch 15 minutes of highlights and get the whole ball game. Why do I need to watch the rest of it? But it allowed me to put, give more time to my family. You know, the devil has many weapons that he uses. Um, and distraction is certainly one of them. Fathers, if you are, if you are battling a storm in your life, I would ask you to look to Jesus. He's still in the business of calming storms. You know, you and I first have to calm the storms in our own life before we can help with our family and our neighbors, our workmates, whoever it might be. But if we're still battling with anger and, and, and hatred and temptation and all of these things, we're no good to anybody else. So fathers... Today, I would challenge you to be less distracted and more focused on your family. And when a storm arises, look to Jesus. He and he alone will calm that storm.